really far. So again, thank you everybody for joining June's Tenant Talk Live um, and happy Pride Month. Um, and I believe it's also Caribbean uh, Heritage Month as well. So uh, happy all of those months for all who- um, We call for eight. Give the union, write a check for $1.25 an hour. Can I for, ask you to mute real quick? Instead of giving, you know, instead of having your pay and having a deck and all that kind of stuff. There we go. I'll share the rules in a minute, but just make sure to stay muted, folks, if you're not Have you ever been in a meeting? Thank you so much. But again, welcome to June's Tenant Talk Live. And my name is Sid Bentoncourt. And for those that are new, I'm a project manager for inclusive community engagement with the coalition. I also uh, use she, they pronouns. Um, and uh, for everyone, uh, oh, seven. hi, Lauren. Hey, <laughs> Awesome. All right. So again, thank you so much for joining and for anyone who's new to the Tenant Talk Live meetings. This is where we provide an opportunity for you all to connect with NLHC and with one another and to share best practices about influencing federal housing policies um, and leading within your communities. Uh, and um, for folks who might not be aware, this meeting will be recorded and uploaded to YouTube afterwards so that other folks can also view it who aren't able to be here today. But today's guests um, include two advocates from Washington, but before I pass it over to them, I'll just briefly go over some announcements that we have um, from the coalition and also just um, some brief uh, logistics and stuff. And I'll begin by sharing our um, our community agreements so that we can go over them really fast. If it'll let me, let's see, there we go. Okay. All right, so we have our community agreements. Um, and again, if folks have any feedback for these or want to um, add any additional community agreements to these, we can always uh, feel free to email me and give me any of that feedback. For, for this year, we came to agreement on the platinum rule, which is treat others the way they want to be treated. In other words, please consider how others want to be treated and how that might differ from how you want to be treated. Um, also, muting your mic except when speaking. Uh, listen with an open mind and empathy, taking up space, but also giving space to others. And then again, just a reminder that this meeting is recorded and shared online. Awesome. And then again, you can always email me if you have any um, feedback to add to those agreements. And then this is just a reminder that if you're signed up for NLHC emails, you should be receiving one this Friday called The Connection, which will contain all of the recap materials for this call, including the recording, um, the chat, and the links that were shared um, in the chat as well. So if you don't get them today, you can get them later. So, <laughs> uh, I, I love all the interaction in the chat today. I feel like y'all are being really, really good today. <laughs> but um, you can view that um, email sign up right there if you're not signed up for emails. But if you want to view last week, month's resources, you can also view them in the chat. And then I just have one policy update really quick before I pass it on. But the um, policy update that I have is that NLHC is circulating an organizational sonine letter that's supporting HUD's efforts to reduce barriers um, to HUD assisted housing for folks who are formerly incarcerated and convicted people um, and their families. And so this letter is going to be open to any national, state, local, or tribal organization, and it's going to close on June 9th, which I believe is this upcoming Sunday. Um, so I'll make sure to post a link for that in the chat for you all so that you have access to that if you're part of an organization. However, if you're not part of an organization, there's still an opportunity for you to submit a public comment. Um, and after that comment period ends, HUD will review everybody's comments um, before publishing a final rule 
And your comment doesn't have to be long. If you want it to be long, it can be however long you want it to be. Um, but our our research has kind of shown that when you talk about your own experiences um, and what you know from your own experience, that usually really helps a lot. But we do recommend that folks have at least 30% of original content within their, their comments. So if you're using a comment portal, like I will share in the chat shortly, just make sure that you yeah. make it um, as unique as you can so that it doesn't get um, filtered out by HUD. But yeah, I just posted that in the chat for you all. And then lastly, for some logistics, if you have any questions throughout the um, call today, feel free to drop them in the chat. And if we have time at the end, I'll also make sure to um, call anybody who has their hand up um, so that they can unmute themselves. And again, we just ask that you stay muted if you're not speaking. We we understand that sometimes like accidents happen and you unmute yourself, but um, if that ends up being the case, I'll just try to um, mute y'all. But in the meantime, I'll go ahead and introduce our guest for today. We have two um, wonderful guests from Washington. Uh, the first one, we have Marley J. Um, is it Hawkin Donner? I'm so sorry. <laughs> no problem, Hawkin Donner. Hawkin Donner, thank you so much, Marley. Um, and Marley has served as the executive director for the Northwest Fair Housing Alliance. Um, that really helps with fair housing education and advocacy based out of um, Spokane, Washington. And she's been doing that since 2005. And we also have James Hill joining us today, who is a bilingual Spanish disability speaker, professional growth and self-advocacy trainer, creator of um, professional growth for previously incarcerated video workshop series, and recently served as executive director for the Ethnic Support Council of Cowlitz County. So I'll let both of them take it away. I'll drop some ways to connect with James in the chat as well, but let's get started. And I guess, Marley, if you want to go first. Actually, I think we we discussed uh, James. Oh, yes, yes, go sorry. ahead and go first, <laughs> and then I'll, I'll uh, follow up. Thanks. Sounds good. No worries. I'll get started. Um, hello, everyone. My name is James Hill. Um, as Sid pointed out, uh, I have, uh, I am a, a very uh, much of a uh, advocate for homelessness and housing. Um, I'm going to give a little brief, um, brief intro as far as my background. So Martin, my, so, so. so my, my uh, daughter uh, moved from Texas. I'm originally from Texas. My daughter moved with me um, in 2016. And she moved uh, up here with a one-year-old daughter with her. So um, it was a teen mom. And when she moved here, um, I was living in a place where it was not appropriate for uh, a 16-year-old and a one-year-old baby. Uh, so we became homeless at that point. Um, we um, slept in our car sometimes. We slept in um, friend's house. Sometimes I would find housing for them and then I would park the car out in front and I would sleep in the car. They would let me go in and take a shower. Um, I was working all during that time. But what it came down to was that there was a, there was a little bitty um, rule with the National Apartment Association is that if you owed any kind of previous past rent, then you could not sign a new lease um, unless that past debt was paid off. And so my finances could afford month deposits, everything going forward, but I couldn't take care of the, the past. So on top of that, um, May 28th of 2019, um, after sitting in a waiting room for almost about five hours, they had my first overnight stay in the hospital. Um, I hear, Mr. Hill, you have transverse myelitis. And those words were bittersweet. Uh, first came, I knew that there was something going on with me. And then came, there's something going on with me. So during four weeks of hospitalization between two different hospitals, um, I started researching. Um, I researched the causes, the symptoms, treatments, prognosis, what other diseases can mimic this, how it can mimic other diseases. 
Google does not replace a medical degree, but uh, you would swear after a few a few minutes talking with me that I had just got my medical degree. I armed myself with so much information that I knew the questions that the doctors would ask, the next courses of treatments they would try, and the tests that they would run. And if someone asked me about spinal cord injuries or diseases, I could give an hour long discourse over it. I felt like I knew everything there was to know about transverse myelitis. So transverse myelitis, uh, what is it? So the Mayo Clinic, uh, Mayo Clinic uh, ORG provides an excellent description. Uh, simply put, a material called myelin covers the nerve endings surrounding uh, the spinal cord. And if you get inflammation in your spine, whether from a specific cause or idiopathically, or meaning that they don't know uh, the, the cause of it, then it causes that myelin to eat away at itself. And with those nerve endings now exposed, it creates kind of a short in the wires. And mm -hmm. it can happen anywhere in your spinal cord, uh, the parts of my body uh, connected to now exposed nerves in my spine. Um, I no longer have complete control over. So it left me It left me with a condition in addition to this transverse myelitis with a second condition called Brown Support Syndrome. And Brown Support Syndrome uh, essentially, and that simply put, is with the injury that I have in my cervical or in my neck, it's on my left side that's derm that has damaged my nerve injury. So because the nerves are damaged on the left side and these nerves are what controls the rest of your body, it splits, um, it essentially splits my body directly in half. So on the left side of my body, um, I, I, have, I don't have very much uh, fine motor skills. I have some weaknesses. And then on my right side, I have all of my strength, everything, except I have no sensation. So you can be holding a lighter or an ice cube to my skin, and I could not tell the difference. So the Mayo Clinic does go on to say that uh, with, with both of these diseases, but specifically with transverse myelitis, transverse myelitis is a cousin to MS, essentially. And so about 1,400 people a year get it, um, and about 33,000 people have a disability as a result from it. So there's there's kind of three tiers. So you have the top tier of people that can come down with it and they can recover pretty well to where they can go back to almost no physical um, inabilities at all. Then you have the, the middle third that will recover, but maybe till about 70, 75%, maybe 80, 85%, but there's going to be some noticeable, um, some noticeable traits that they've had this disability, like in my case. And then there's those bottom third that can become paralyzed. Um, it can be from neck down. Um, it can affect each person differently. And there is nothing that I could have done to prevent it from coming. It chose me. Now what? So doctors do not know why transverse myelitis affects uh, some more than others. Um, however, they do think that the faster the symptoms show up, uh, the harder it is for you to recover. So I've had cuts, bruises, injuries, colds, flus, depression, anxiety, and I knew what to expect mostly from those things. Eventually, I could and would feel better, but not this time. I cried, fought with doctors over treatments, felt sorry for myself, cried some more. I felt like transverse myelitis chopped me down and I no longer had a sense of independence or, or the ability to be a provider. I knew I was not going to heal from this. Here's what I did not know that I would learn from this. I did not know I would learn what self-advocation really meant 
until I had to fight with doctors and make sure that I'm receiving the right care and treatment. So I didn't fall, just like fall through the cracks um, of an already overloaded list of patients uh, that this doctor is seeing. I did not know that I would learn what it really meant to swallow your pride until I had to allow yeah, others okay. to help me to stand, walk, or at times use the restroom. I did not know that I would learn what it means to be resourceful until going over every skill that I have and making a list of those skills that I could still use. I really did not know how this disability would change my life forever. So having to kind of rethink my goals I had at the time, um, I had to rethink my dreams of what I wanted to accomplish and how I was going to accomplish it. So it was no longer my health, hospitals, needles, transverse myelitis, brown support syndrome, really that scares me now. What I want to accomplish is really what scares me. That fear, though, gives me that motivation to, to keep focusing, uh, really to keep focusing on my self-care and, and the things that I can do for me to stay healthy. And it gives me the reminder to be grateful for the things that are granted before the things that are granted are taken away from me. So that fear is what helps me to really grow and to keep pushing forward. Are there days when I ask myself, how can I motivate someone else when I can't even motivate myself out of bed? Yep. Are there days when I lack the confidence or ability to, to take the steps needed to reach my dreams? Absolutely. Are there days when the birds maybe don't chirp as loud as they could? Yeah. When I'm in fear and doubt, I push with that determination. I learn from the things that I've gone through and I keep pushing ahead. So what does that have to do with everyone today? So when we think about our lives and we think about our goals and we think about everything that we want to accomplish, no matter who we are, no matter what position we're in, whether we clean toilets, whether we are the president of the United States. If something happens to you today, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to learn from? It? Are you going to allow it to keep you down, slow you down, and stop you? So the two most important days of your life, according uh, according to, uh, wow, why can I not think of this gentleman's name? I'll come back to his name. I know it. <laughs> Mark Twain. Uh, two most important days of your life is the day you're born and the day you find out why. So when I think about my daughter moving up here and us being homeless, I did not sit and wait. I did not. I went in and I filled out every application I could. But you know what the problem was? The problem was that there was no place for us. You know why? There's no place for a single dad with kids. There's places for everyone else. Well, mostly everyone else. And so I could have just kind of given up at that point. But I reached out and I filled out application after application, after program, after agency, after person, after phone call. And after I did that, I didn't sit back and wait until they got in touch with me. I would start back from the beginning. Have you heard anything? How can I do this? Where can I go? Because if we stay in the spot that we are in, if we stay where we are, it really doesn't matter that the stars exist if you cannot see yourself reaching. So self-care. Uh, self-care taught me or allowed me to reach out to Council for the Homeless that is located in Vancouver, Washington. Um, 
they hold a very sweet and dear spot uh, to me. Uh, anytime I have the chance, I will spread praises about them. But through their uh, program, through their uh, partnership, uh, they took care of the previous debt that I had. And even though I told them that's all I needed, they paid for my deposit and the first three months into a new place for my daughter, my granddaughter. And so that self-care really told me that I, it's not really, um, if, if I thought that, okay, well, I go get a massage every once in a while. Um, and I may even, I may even go get a manicure. Yes. I'm a guy that gets manicures. Not all the time, <laughs> but that's not self-care. That's maintenance. That's maintenance. What is self-care for you? What's something that feeds your soul? What is something, whether that is uh, physical, going for a walk, whether that is spiritual? And I didn't say you have to believe in God, that spiritual can entail everything. Um, There's so many different levels of, of self-care that when you really, you, if you try any of them, during your work day, a lot of times people say, oh, I'll, 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 uh, and Sid, you're going to have to um, stop me at my time because I will continue talking. <laughs> no, it's okay. <laughs> you're good. <laughs> so, so what, when you are working during your, your work day, um, how many times does your break come around and your lunch come around? And you're sitting at your desk eating lunch. That's great. You are you're eating. Some people don't eat. <laughs> but you are working. You're not taking time away. There is no project. There is no job. There is no employer. There is no person that's going to take better care of you than you. So as you're going through these different stages of your life, we're going through uh, all of the, the, the mental stress, the physical stress that we're faced with. When your if your life changes, you really have to be ready for it. And trust me, it will be more of a mental battle than it is a physical. So as we are developing um, our programs and we're thinking about how best to help those that are out in the field or help our clients, um, it really is important to think about um, putting yourself in their spot, in their position. Um, I do as, 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 as well off as it seems like I am, uh, I still work with uh, the area of aging and disability. Um, I have a caregiver. Matter of fact, she's here right now. Um, if you, if, if, if those services are helping you, we apply for them. It doesn't matter. Um, there are times where we may just sit and talk. It doesn't always have to be things like that. What about um, reaching out to your case manager because you need a ramp? And the case manager says, you know, I'm sorry, we can't get a, a ramp because uh, because this is what I was told at first. The way your entrance is in order for get a ramp and it has to be so many steps per feed. And, you know, it's going to be a ramp all the way to the end of the driveway. OK, so am I not supposed to go in and out of my home? What's the next step? So you can tell me, no, that's fine. But what's the next step? And so when you are applying for these different services and you're applying for these different modifications, currently I have um, I have a rep that does not have to go out to my driveway because they're able to kind of L-shape it. Um, I also have uh, uh, handrails, hand, handrails uh, beside my uh, toilet. Do I need them all the time? No but they're there when I need them. Um, I also have, which I did not know they make, uh, which is pretty awesome. 
they have what's called a, a bed king. And essentially, it straps to your mattress, and it's a handle that goes on there. It helps you to kind of pull in and out of bed. I've used it many times, and before I used to be embarrassed of saying these things because I am in, I'm in my forties. I won't say my age. I am in my forties, and there is no way that I thought that I would be using these things. Um, I have a cane. I have a walker. Um, and one thing that actually working with Department of Vocational Rehab, um, they were able to pay for me is called a Jazzy Carbon, which is a collapsible power chip. That was a game changer. Because that means that I could still drive and take a power chair with me because I still need it on if I'm walking long distances, if I am uh, walking on uneven terrains. So when when these services and agencies are are really trying to help you, allow them to help. Swallow your pride. Take that assistance, but don't just sit on it. Don't sit and wait until they contact you. Be determined because you are just one person on their list. And those that are the case managers, you have to understand that these people, they have no other option. So if there's something that you are not able to do, sometimes there's a better way to deliver that message than, no, we can't do that. How about this didn't work? How about if we try something else? Maybe we will look for a different agency outside of your agency. So that's my story. Um, what I will end with is through the help that I've received, um, I am in a, a better position than that I've been being able to be, uh, to give back to those, to give back to my community. I am in a, uh, an area in Kelso, Washington that is 85% non-color. And even though, <laughs> even though there are still our ability to be able to, uh, bring together community, to build our BIPOC community and our leaders in our area, but as well as just to form that unity. Because you have power individually. Think about the power that you can have when you connect with everyone else. Thank you for your time. I appreciate everyone for being here. And Ms. Sid will uh, drop my uh, social links in the uh, in the chat at some point. Um, and thank you all very much. Thank you so much, James, for, for sharing your story. And it was really inspiring. And I think a lot of us needed to hear it, including myself. <laughs> so, so thank you so much. Um, and we'll go ahead and do some Q and A, um, after Marley's um, presentation, but if y'all have questions, feel free to keep dropping them in the chat folks and I'll keep track of them so that we can answer them later. But thank you again, James. Well, um, thanks for sharing, um, some of your personal experiences, James, really inspiring. And, um, it sounds like you're helping a lot of people in the community now as well. Um, I'm here to talk from a little bit more of a technical um, process oriented perspective. Um, I work with Northwest Fair Housing Alliance. We are a fair housing agency. And so I just want to share a little bit about the kinds of things that agencies like ours can do and some of the tools that are available in the Fair Housing Act for people with disabilities. I did see a comment in the chat, which was um, pretty on point as far as what we're seeing here in Washington State and probably elsewhere that um, it is really almost impossible to get a tenant attorney unless you have an eviction paper in hand. Um, there aren't a lot of resources otherwise to help with situations that come up up until the point of, of needing an attorney in court. And so um, the Fair Housing Act can't do everything, but, but it can be a very creative tool to help people with disabilities um, advocate for themselves or family members or friends to get reasonable accommodations or modifications that may enable them to stay in their house. 
and um, continue to living where they're living because housing is uh, so important now. Once once you lose it, it's it's really challenging given the rising rents, the low vacancy rates to to get into other housing, and then um, never mind safe housing and affordable housing. Um, so there are some really um, critical tools that can be used in the Fair Housing Act to try and get into housing, to stay in housing, and sometimes up until um, an eviction, prevent an eviction from occurring. So it's not, it doesn't do everything, unfortunately, but um, our team, which is small but mighty, we have six people here at Northwest Fair Housing Alliance that um, serve Eastern and Central Washington State. There's another organization on the West side that does the same. And we provide services free of charge to people um, who feel that they've been exper they've experienced housing discrimination, um, and that includes uh, needing reasonable accommodations and modifications. A lot of people come to us; they've been trying to get them on their own, and either they didn't know how to do it, they didn't know what to ask, um, what the process was, or their housing providers weren't informed about fair housing, and so um, unlawfully denied their requests. So we do a lot of advocacy with people. Um, our, our preference is to empower people, give them tools so that they can request accommodations in the future or modifications on their own if needed. Um, and some people are more able to do that than others. Some people need more support. Um, and so we will, if uh, somebody else, if somebody doesn't have a support system or they don't feel that they um, are able to advocate for themselves directly, we often walk with them um, side by side through the reasonable accommodation process. And so you can get pretty creative with it. I like um, James saying, you know, don't basically don't accept no, you know, what else can we do? What else can we do? And reasonable accommodations can really, really, really be a great tool for that. Essentially, they are an exception to a rule or a policy. So a housing provider can have rules, um, but sometimes somebody with a disability needs an exception to that rule or policy. And that can be anything from asking for a reserved parking place, if it's a first come first serve, asking for an assistance animal, um, asking to get out of your lease early. If the housing is no longer working for you, um, you're on a second floor, and there's stairs and you can't navigate the stairs now, um, getting out of the lease early without penalty, um, without being charged all the, the lease early lease termination fees that usually come up. Um, similarly, extending tenancies. Sometimes that can be the case. Um, if it's not a real serious cause reason that you're being terminated, uh, it may be asking for a little bit more time um, before you have to leave, depending on what the circumstances are. Um, caregivers, that's another one. We do a lot of work with people, um, getting people approved to be caregivers, um, extra bedrooms. And accommodations don't just apply to HUD or federal funded housing. A lot of people think that applies to market housing. Um, it applies to housing counseling services, applies to housing authorities, um, vouchers. So if somebody needs um, you know, three bedrooms and there's a disability related reason for needing three bedrooms rather than two, that could be a reasonable accommodation. Really there, there are as many um, variations of accommodations as there are people and disabilities and needs. And so sometimes just being really creative um, and oftentimes the, the person knows what they need and at, talking to them and asking them, what is it that you need? Um, and then uh, we can help explain to the housing provider that if it's reasonable and the things that go into reasonableness are like, it shouldn't cost the housing provider a lot of money, um, shouldn't be a big, a fundamental change to their program. You know, if it's not, um, uh, supportive housing, asking someone to give you your medications or take you to the grocery store, that's not going to be a reasonable accommodation and so on. But um, it, uh, you know, really the, it, it's a very creative tool that can be used up until, at least in Washington state, a writ of um, eviction is issued until the court has issued an order of eviction. And so um, it's something that I encourage you to, if you're in a role of advocacy, whether for yourself or for a community group, um, to learn about reasonable accommodations and modifications, which are adding structural things like, like the grab bars, like um, 
um, levers instead of handles, um, things that make it accessible for people in um, what might not otherwise be accessible units. So reasonable modifications, that's another tool that's available. So I just encourage you to learn more about that. And in this time frame, you know, I'm not going to be able to give you a crash course on that whole thing, but do reach out to most states, not all, but most states do have fair housing agencies um, and some have more than one, some of the bigger metropolitan areas. Um, and so if you're not able to get an attorney um, to help you with something, it may be if, if it's disability related, if there's a disability related connection, you might be able to work with a fair housing agency to learn about how to ask for an accommodation. Um, it could be for something in terms of trying to overcome barriers to getting into housing. For example, um, there's a lot of um, these digital um, portals to apply. And you have to, some of them you can't even bypass if you don't have employment income. If you are, you know, it'll prompt you for your SSI or excuse me, for your employment income, but there's nowhere to put if you have SSI, SSDI, a Section 8 voucher. Um, and so asking as a reasonable accommodation, can I do this um, via email? Can I do it with a hard copy? You know, some other way um, to go about it. Uh, criminal history is another area. If there was something that was criminal history in an applicant's past and there's a disability related connection, um, perhaps undiagnosed mental illness at the time um, that's now been mitigated with medication or something, um, you know, you could, there may be a, an accommodation that can help. Please don't um, apply that rule to me. I need an exception to that rule because of my disability uh, related needs. So you can get really creative with it. So I just want to make people aware of that. Our website, I can drop it in. We have quite a few tools on our site, um, nwfairhouse.org. Um, we offer trainings from time to time, but do try and connect with your fair housing agencies um, if you're at all working with advocating for people with disabilities and housing. Awesome. Thank you so much, Marley. And I'm about to drop that link in the chat for you. <laughs> um, but yes, thank you both so much again for sharing your story and for sharing your expertise with the group. We'll now do some Q&A. And I did have some like questions and comments that I think would be good to get to. Um, I'll do one and then I'll hand it over to Manisha, who has... Um, her hand up so I think the first one was um this one is like more of like a general question but are there any agencies that cater to the disabled population I think this one was from uh Pamela but any organizations out there whether they're national or more local um we have a lot of people from across the country so if you know of any national orgs that might be more helpful So for, um, and I don't, I, I feel like it should be national, um, part of state or the federal benefits, but Department of Vocational Rehab, um, sh they should be in any state, um, the, and anyone correct me if I'm wrong, but the benefit of Department of Vocational Rehab is that if you are disabled and you are trying to uh, work, then they essentially remove any obstacles that are in your path. So uh, my obstacle being able to, uh, one of the things is that they are uh, helping me to go back to school and getting around to all my classes. So um, there, there's Department of Vocational Rehab specifically for those with disabilities, but reach out to, if you have a case manager, reach out to those case managers as well to find those resources. Awesome. Thank you so much, James. Marley, did you want to add to that? Um, no, I don't think so. I mean, there's, there's, uh, you know, state and regional specific ones, um, you know, disability rights. Washington is one in Arc of Spokane, but um, um, yeah, I think, I think regionally they're, they're going to vary. Sorry, my dog decided that it was not time for her to sing. So if you guys hear her barking in the background, I am so sorry, but I'll hand it over to Manisha and then we'll see if we can do another chat one and then we'll go to Beck. Sure. You might hear my uh, cat, actually. <laughs> she she likes to meow, too. <laughs> um, I just have a question. This has been kind of an issue for me. Um, I have neurological issues that have been progressive 
Um, similar to James's story, you know, it started in one way. And I was actually homeless when I found out, too. I was living with people at the time. It was because of my asthma and allergies. It was because of medication. Um, and now I recently just got diagnosed with a new spinal cord progression. And I'm losing, fun I basically have lost function in my hands. I'm losing some of my speech and uh, hearing as well. And so it's really hard for me right now to fill out paperwork. <laughs> so it's like, even right now, like I'm going through a rent issue and like they send me, legal aid sends me packets of paperwork. And I'm trying to tell them like, I can't fill out your paperwork. <laughs> like I need somebody to come here to my house and fill it out. Like I, and nobody seems to want to do that. Nobody has any solutions to do that. They're like, call the church, call people. I'm like, I don't have any people. I haven't been out of my house in five years because we had a pandemic, you know? Um, I used to be very heavily community, community involved. You know, my master's is in theology. I used to literally be community involved, but like, there's just nothing. I don't have friends anymore. I don't have people that can do that kind of thing. And it's kind of the same thing with trying to file HUD complaints. I've been through so much retaliation, so many case managers, so many things. I have like four pending cases right now, just with Medicaid and everything else. It's like, I, I can't get somebody to come here and help with paperwork. And that's what I really, really need. And it all stems back to disability related things. And like, you know, I can't really use dictation software. It doesn't work really well for me. So how do I get an accommodation for that for legal reasons? Are you going to go ahead, oh, James? <laughs> sorry. I, was, <laughs> I didn't know if you were going to jump in or not. Uh, so, um, and I'm sorry, you are going through those neurological conditions. Uh, they are no joke. Um, it Thanks. affects you. Um, what I will say is, are, are you on any kind of disability at all? Yeah. Yeah, so I'm on a waiver. I'm homebound. They actually just took away my waiver by accident due to a clerical error. So actually, like now my my mom is my caregiver. She's not getting paid. And she was helping me pay my rent. So like we don't have rent money for this month. And like we've gone through this whole issue with our county. I got evicted six times during the pandemic because I found every loophole. And same thing with funds to pay for the you know evictions or anything they have all these loopholes for people with physical disabilities that they won't pay they're like you can go to a nursing home so therefore you we won't pay that's basically what i've been told all through the past um so like i'm terrified now to call 211 because that's the answer i get well i would uh so the reason why i asked if you're on any like disability uh is to see if you had a caregiver um and if your mom's your caregiver i can understand that that situation that dynamic as well um, what my, my only suggestion, um, uh, is to don't take no for an answer. And I only, the only reason why I chuckle as I say that is because a lot of times that's what we'll get is like, no, we don't have a service to help you. Uh, but there is something out there. Um, you have a disability, you need an accommodation and, uh, I'm sure someone will find an answer, but just keep pushing. It, it sucks, but keep pushing. Yeah, I've contacted all my elected officials. I know somebody said that I've contacted everybody in the state, U.S. level. I mean, we're, they took away SSI last year because I got the eviction funds. So they said that was money that I got. So they took they took, took away my SSI. I mean, everything. Anytime I get something, they take away something else. And so it's just like, I can't win. <laughs> And I didn't. I'm. I'm sorry as well that you're you're going through this. Um, I didn't catch the the type of paperwork that you were wanting assistance with. But to the extent that it's it's a program, um, whether it's a housing authority or some kind of rent assistance, I would ask for a reasonable accommodation to them. They probably receive federal funds and ask for an accommodation for them to come to you. They may try and tell you that it's unreasonable because it's an undue financial hardship or something for them to do that to make time. But I, I would at least try that. And the accommodation doesn't have to be in writing as well. I just want everybody to know that it can be verbal. Um, it's most helpful if it's in writing so that you have the evidence that it that it occurred. But um, you know, if you have a witness, your mom, somebody there is you're asking for this on the phone. I, I would try that if you if have if you haven't. Thank you. That's really helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I don't know if I cut someone off. Okay, I heard somebody or somebody in the chat also mentioned the Bazelon Center, which is like really good as well for um 
uh, for like mental health concerns um, and any type of um, like mental health disabilities involving like any civil um, rights and housing rights. We had like one of their attorneys come to our forum this year to talk about that kind of stuff. So um, I know there were like some folks talking about that in the chat. Um, I'll pass it over to, to Beck, if that's okay. And then we'll take another question from the chat. So much said. This is Beck. Um, this is less a question and more of a, a resource share. Um, because there was uh the question asked about disability resources. Um, every jurisdiction in the United States has is covered by what's called the Center for Independent Living for People with Disabilities. Um, so if you are looking to, I can post in the chat. There's a database called the Independent Living Resource Utilization Database. Um. And it will show you if you put in either your state or your or your zip code or your, or your city what uh, center for independent what center for uh, what center for independent living uh, covers your area. Um, I know that that it's an imperfect system, and I and I definitely heard heard in the chat that um, some folks are sent kind of um, in a in a circle, and and so it's definitely not like going to solve everything with a with a magic wand but it it can be a really great resource additionally um uh uh i forgot what i was gonna say oh um one one thing to keep in mind that's really exciting is um about government benefits is that uh social services is uh adding some new edits to their to their program social security administration under martin o'malley the new commissioner or I guess not the new commissioner, but um, the acting commissioner. Um, and he's making some really fun changes. Um, well, one of fun or no need necessary changes, I should say. For example, um, if you do an SSI overpayment, they won't. They would before have the right to garnish your entire wages, so like a hundred percent of your SSI to pay back that overpayment, even if it's their fault. Um, now they're they have payment plans. Um, and they're going to work with you and the burden of proof falls on SSI or on social security. Um, and so that's all, all really well. And then the last thing I wanted to mention was someone had mentioned um, uh, the, the, oh, uh, I think it was Marley, uh, you had mentioned about uh, the verbal um, uh, reasonable accommodation. And I want to yes and that and say that the burden of proof for reasonable accommodation falls on the entity, not the individual, especially in those situations. So if you have like a mom, a person that whatever that th that was there and said, yeah, I heard so and so say that they would do X, Y, Z thing, then it is on the landlord or the person that made that promise to prove that they did not say that. Over. Thank you so much, Beck, for that wisdom. Marley, I don't know if you wanted, I, I saw you in mute. I just wanted to make sure I didn't miss anything. Okay. Um, I see like a lot of comments in the chat too. I don't know if they're like questions or comments, but one of the ones that I saw earlier is um somebody saying that, you know, they like provide the laws um or like the regulations needed to advocate for themselves. Um, but then they get stuck after that or like they don't see any movement after that. So do you guys have any like guidance or tips, advice around how to address that if there's nothing happening after they show those regulations and stuff? Yeah, from, from, um, from a, I guess, a fair housing process perspective, once the request for an accommodation is made, the housing provider is supposed to respond within a reasonable time. It's not spelled out what that is, but it needs to be, you know, within a reasonable time. And ultimately, if the housing provider is not responding or not granting the accommodation, then the next step would be to move on to file a complaint. And that can be done either with HUD administratively. It can be done sometimes with a state human rights commission or um a state fair housing agency. We have the Washington State Human Rights Commission here. Um, you can go to court. And of course, that, that requires usually assistance in navigating that process. So 
Um, probably at that point you could start if again, and if you have a fair housing agency that's helpful, reach out to them. I do see some comments, you know, every, they're, they're varying uh, levels probably of, of effectiveness, but if you can get a fair housing agency to help you, um, the next step, often if somebody has asked for an accommodation on their own and they're not getting anywhere, sometimes by us having the letterhead behind our name, you know, behind the request can kind of shake it loose. Um, and we can give the housing provider a little education about what the fair housing laws require and that will often do it because a complaint is not a fast process if you file a complaint with hud you know it's going to be months down the road you might get something um, that will be in the form of damages for what you've experienced but it's not going to be immediate so um, we try at first to, to shake that loose if we can um, with our agency behind it on the letterhead but it's it's going to come down to what resources you have what organizations you can work with mm -hmm. And just real quick, I'll say, uh, remember, policy is uh, does not trump uh, use of a bad word, uh, does not trump um, federal uh, federal law. And so just remember that just because that's their policy or, or they normally do not do that, uh, if it goes against your 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 rights, against your federal laws, then push, push, push. Thank you both. Um, okay, so before we log off for the day, I'll let um, Chandra ask her question and then we'll close out for the day. Um, so I guess I was just kind of wondering like, so if you can't get a voucher and you can't like, you don't qualify for any of the like housing stuff and your past like rental history was kind of messed up by the previous like by the place that was supposed to be paying the, the rent like the voucher program like where are, what are you supposed to do in going forward from there like to advocate for yourself or to like try to figure something out because I haven't been able to find like anything and I I mean I'm still in the process of getting like disability I'm hoping not to get denied but like you know that's where I'm at I'm, I don't know who to talk to at all because nobody's answered my calls. <laughs> so, so um, is this your first time applying for disability? Yes. So prepare yourself. About 80-85% of the time you will get denied your first time. Just because you're denied your first time, do not say, okay, well, I guess I don't have a disability. Um, I someone told me that they may have gotten better with that but just prepare for that first um and when it comes to the housing if you are in this process are you on any kind of uh, state benefits um and I'm, you don't have to actually give me that detail what what my main question is is that um do you have an agency or a program that's able to pay for uh like medicaid do you have medicaid at, at all so I do have uh, what's called Badger Care Plus, but um, and I, I have a program that I work with called Comprehensive Community Services that tries to do a holistic um, assistance for people with disabilities and mental health issues. The problem is they can't find anything for me either, and they have housing specialists. So, Well, um it sounds redundant and it sounds like it won't work, but I, I keep saying, just don't give up. Uh, what, what's the saying? The noisy wheel gets the oil. Uh, well, you become two noisy wheels. Um, pretty soon they will get tired of hearing from you or they'll give you some kind of direction to go to. Um, and then sometimes you may have to do it from a, of a, of a place of kindness, niceness, maybe stroke their ego uh, to get somewhere. But I say these things because I've had to do them, but, I, I wish you good fortune with that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, James. Um, and thank you to both James and Marley for joining us today for this conversation um, and for helping us learn a little bit more about um, disability justice, accessibility and modifications. Obviously, like the conversation isn't going to end here and we're hoping to like continue it because this is like a conversation that should really be a part of 
all the conversations we're having because it's so integral to to housing justice so thank you both for joining us and thank you to the audience for being so engaging as always i i appreciate you all um but just to close us out um our next tenant talk live will be on july 1st um and it'll be centered um kind of around the um like immigration and migrant crisis that's happening right now um and we're going to have some folks to come and talk to us about that um from folks who are working directly with um, impacted communities and you can register for that next session at the link that I'm about to drop in the chat for you all um, and then we're also looking for blog post authors for NLHC's on the home front blog on an ongoing basis so if you're interested in being a guest author and sharing more a little bit um, about your story you can feel free to reach out to our field team at the email I just dropped at the uh, chat. And then you're also welcome to join our Facebook group so that you can stay connected to folks here outside of the call. And as always, if y'all have any questions for me, you can feel free to email me um, directly and we'll make sure to follow up with both um, Marley and James email and the recap email that goes out on Friday. But yeah, thank you all so, so, so much and we'll see you in july have a good night everybody thanks Sid. take care thanks, thanks. james